Hi, this is Phil from Simply Rhino, and in this video I'm going to start with the Rhino model that I brought into Twinmotion in the previous video. I'll first look at geolocating the model before applying materials and characters. I'll show a couple of ways of applying vegetation, and then how to create vehicle and character paths for dynamic content. Finally, I'll explain the process of creating and exporting a video. I'm using Rhino 7 and Twinmotion 2021.1.4, and for the purposes of this video, I'm using the Windows platform. Here's the Rhino file I created in the last session, and once again, many thanks to Ott Candry for the use of this model. Ott is an architect who uses Rhino and Grasshopper, and this model is a personal project called Hybrid Pavilion. Following the last video, I've cleaned up the geometry a little bit and made a few minor changes. Just as in the last session, we have a simple layer structure which will be replicated in twin motion. Materials have been applied to our Rhino geometry as, once inside twin motion, these can be replaced either on a per material or per object basis. So these Rhino materials could really be considered proxy materials as they are always going to be replaced, especially in the case of the brick texture on the landscape here, which is being used solely to verify the texture mapping. If I now launch twin motion, and open the saved hybrid pavilion file, then the link between Rhino and Twinmotion will be re-established. If I maximize the view and move the camera to look down onto the geometry, then it looks as though that brick texture is incorrectly mapped, so I'll fix this later. Just like Rhino, I can geolocate the geometry and set the date and time, and this is done in settings. The first thing I'm going to do here is to set my location. So I'll search for London and choose the appropriate result from the list. This will drop me in the middle of the Thames, but this will be fine for this demo. Next, I can set the date and time of day. So I'll set the month to August and the time to around 4 p.m. One of the benefits of the Datasmith exporter is that the absolute position of my geometry in Rhino and Twinmotion is now the same. So the understanding of north relative to the geometry is of course identical. Just like Rhino, I'm able to change the north angle offset and I can do this with this slider. Finally, in location, I can change the background and I have several presets from which I can choose. Here I'll go with European City for now, and I can also rotate this background. Going back to settings, I can control the weather, lighting and camera. So let's dive into weather. Here I can move from sunny to rainy with this slider, and the rain is of course animated. In season, I can move from summer to winter, and if I'm in the winter, then moving the weather slider will produce snow. Later on, when we apply trees and vegetation to our model, I can make these grow, and I can also add other effects, including wind speed, smog, etc. If I go back to settings, I can adjust the lighting in terms of exposure, white balance, global illumination and shadow. And I may come back to adjust some of these once I have the majority of materials, finishes and assets established. I can also control the camera settings in terms of field of view, depth of field and here I can set parallelism. This is like two-point perspective in Rhino. So here, if I turn on parallelism, then you can see that the verticals are maintained and my four poles here are now upright and no longer leaning with perspective distortion. Personally, I find that it's easier to manipulate the view when setting up the scene with this feature off, so I'll uncheck this for now. Opening the left-hand panel exposes the material and asset library. 
So now let's look at adding some materials to the scene. I'll start with the hexagonal shading of the large canopy. I'll select one of the hexagonal elements and then hit the F key to zoom selected. Then I can open the material library, choose metal and then for example brushed aluminium 01. As I've already got an object selected, then left clicking on the material will apply the material immediately. Anything that had the same original black rhino material will now have the twin motion aluminium material. If I now move to the panel in the lower part of the screen, I can change the material properties. So first I'll go to colour and make the aluminium slightly more blue. In More here, I can add textures, change the opacity and luminosity, and add some dirt with this grunge slider. I'll zoom out to look at the canopy as a whole, and I think I'll darken the material slightly here by going to Colour and using this slider. So that looks a little better. And finally, I'll just adjust the reflection parameter slightly. Now, it's probably best not to spend too long on these adjustments. It's better to do this later when more elements are set up in the scene. Next, I'll take a look at adding the grass material to replace the brick texture. So, I'll go back to the material library and select Ground and then Nature. And I'll use Grass 4 from the list here. Notice that as I hover over the materials, I'll see a larger preview of the texture. So I'll drag Grass 4 onto my surface to apply the material. And now I've just remembered that the texture mapping is incorrect here. So let's take a look at how I can fix this. I'll go back into Rhino, select the group of surfaces involved and delete the mapping. Next I'll reapply Planar Mapping and draw out a small square here that represents the mapping widget. And then finally I'll select the UV option from the command line. I'll then save the Rhino file and synchronize with Twinmotion. Back in Twinmotion I can see the texture mapping is now correct and consistent across the grouped surfaces. So I'll zoom in and then left click on this little icon here to see the materials already loaded into the Twinmotion document. I can then reapply the Grass 4 material. If I zoom out a little, I can see the grass now looks consistent and I can then adjust the scale of the texture with this slider here. Next, I'm going to add a Twin Motion Water material to replace the proxy material I set up in Rhino. As with the grass material, the reason I set up a material in Rhino is so that I can control the mapping from Rhino and then easily replace the material once I'm inside Twinmotion. From the material browser I'll go to Water, select the surface, zoom in a little and then I'll choose Lake 02. This water material is animated and I have control over basics like water depths and waves and from there I can drill down into some more detailed settings. I can also of course control the colour and I'm just going to darken this slightly. So far I've chosen the location, date and time, weather and added a few basic materials. So next I'm going to add the remaining static materials such as concrete, metals, wood, glass etc. With this being done, I can now start to think about adding the dynamic twin motion content, such as people, vehicles and vegetation. Before I do this, however, I'll just mention a couple of other things. This button here allows me to see the scene in full screen, so decluttering the interface. And I can return to the previous panelled arrangement by left-clicking this button again. If I want to save a camera view, so, like Named Views in Rhino, I can go to Media and Create Image. When you're setting up a scene, 
you might find it useful to save a few views like this as it speeds up navigation. Let's now take a look at creating some twin motion content. And I'll start by adding some characters. So from the asset or library panel on the left, I'll choose characters. Now, before I add anything, I'm going to create a new container and name this 006 characters. I'll make this container active, meaning that the characters I create now will be housed in this folder. This makes it easy to turn the characters on or off globally. So, from animated humans, I'll bring in Chris and I'll put him in an approximate position simply by dragging and dropping. And I'll then zoom in a little closer so I can refine things. The characters have a pivot or manipulator that works a bit like the Rhino Gumball. As I move the character with a manipulator, you'll see that he automatically snaps to the differing ground levels. If I pick the center of the manipulator, I can move him freely while snapping to the ground. And if I use the arrows, I can move in a constrained X, Y or Z direction. I can also rotate using the quarter arc icon. So all in all, very similar to the gumball. Here I'll have alternatives for clothing colour and options for the pose. Standing, talking, dancing, sitting, etc. So I could use a sitting pose and have Chris sitting on this plinth. Now I'll bring in another couple of characters and pose them so that they are interacting with each other. Rather than bringing in characters one by one, I can bring in groups. And this is done in the same way as with single characters. Once the group is positioned, I can then select individual characters and change their pose and clothing colour just as previous. Let's now look at adding trees and vegetation. Now, one reason why I might want to do this is to mask off this barren area around my local context. Now, of course, I could create more built context, but this scenario serves well to show just how easily we can add, in this instance, trees in twin motion. Once again, before I add anything, I'll create a new container, this time naming it 007 trees, and I'll make this container active. If I now select context from the bottom panel, then rather than bringing in hundreds of trees one at a time, I can use vegetation paint. I'll now drag and drop a selection of trees into the browser window here. And when I have the intended variety, I can select the paint tool here. I can adjust the diameter of the paintbrush before and indeed during painting and then I'll start painting. Now if I paint some trees in the wrong place I can erase these later and of course it might make more sense to have a bit more of an elevated view whilst I'm painting in these trees. So once again for the purposes of this video I'm just painting the trees around the boundary of my model so that when I move to a view like this, I'm masking the gap between my model and the distant buildings. I've now added more trees, and if I switch to one of the saved views and rotate about the center of my geometry, you'll see that the trees are now starting to do their job. You'll also probably have noticed that I've been a little careless and there are some trees clashing with my geometry. So what I'll do now is to go to my camera views up here and select the top view and I'll zoom out a little. I'll make sure the painted vegetation layer is still active and then pick the vegetation eraser so I can then rub out the trees I don't want. When I finished, I'll go back to my saved camera view, rotate around the center of the view 
just to check once more again how this is looking. As an alternative to painting in the vegetation, I can use a tool called Vegetation Scatter. And this is useful when, for example, you want to scatter vegetation across a single surface. To demonstrate this, I'll first isolate this road surface. I can do this by first selecting the component and then right-clicking on its name in the right-hand browser and selecting Isolate On Off. This is a toggle and very similar to Isolate in Rhino. I'll now create a new container and name this 008 Grass and Flowers and I'll make this new container active. I'll pick the surface and then navigate to Context and select Vegetation Scatter. As with the previous paint example, I'll choose a few types of grasses and flowers and add these one by one to the browser. When this is done, I'll then select all the chosen items and apply them to the surface using the Scatter Add tool here. If I now zoom into the surface, I can start to see the result. The display is concentrated around the camera target and if I move the view, you'll see the display adapts accordingly. I can add and remove elements from the scatter. So, for example, I can select the violets and then Scatter Remove and here I'll do this for all the flowers. I can easily increase the density of the tall grass by selecting it and clicking a few times on Scatter Add. Using Isolate in this instance is a good way to easily add or remove vegetation and quickly switch back to see this in context. Rather than filling this road full of weeds, perhaps a better idea would be to create some vehicles that travel along it. So I'll delete the container 008 grass and flowers and with it the scattered vegetation. Next I'll go to camera views, select the top view and zoom into the road. Then I'll go to context, select paths and then vehicle path. Here I have a pen tool that works a little bit like the interpolated curve in Rhino and with this I'll draw a path along the road. Once completed I'll start to see the moving vehicles in the preview. Now I can change the number of lanes use a single or double lane change the density of the traffic and the speed If I go back to the perspective view, I can better see the effect of the lane offset tool. And here it looks as though my road isn't wide enough for two lanes, so I'll turn this feature off. I'll now turn off isolate, manipulate the view and look at the result. And here I can make more adjustments if necessary. I've just noticed here that I've forgotten to create a container for this vehicle path, so I'll do this now. In a very similar way to Rhino, I can create the new container and then drag the vehicle path into it. So just like we can do with sublayers in Rhino. Character paths can be created in a very similar way to vehicle paths. So, to quickly show this, I'll create another new container and make this active. Then I'll go to Camera Views and select Top and I'll hide everything apart from the plaza, its associated street furniture and the existing characters and character groups. As before, I can go to Context and select Paths and now I'll choose Character Path. I'll draw a path with the pen tool 
and I'll try to avoid the planters, seating and existing characters. Once this is completed, the preview will start and in the browser window I can choose the character type, clothing, width of path, density and direction. So I'll make some initial adjustments here and then I'll create another path. Then following a few more adjustments I can turn on the visibility of the other containers and switch back to perspective view. Having made more adjustments and added more content let's now have a look at how to quickly create and export a video. I'll start by going to media and then video and selecting click here to create your first video. When I do this my first keyframe will be created and this will be based on the current camera view. This can be adjusted later if necessary. To create the next keyframe I simply move in the viewport and click where indicated. Once I have two or three keyframes I can scrub this timeline marker through them and twin motion will tween through the frames automatically creating a camera path. The part length can be adjusted and individual keyframes can be deleted if necessary. It may take a bit of practice to create convincing looking camera movement and I'm certainly no expert at this but the overall controls are simplicity itself. I'll move the camera using the keyboard shortcuts. These can be shown at the top of the screen as here. And I'll create a series of keyframes as we start to move along the walkway towards the pavilion. Here I'm just going to adjust this keyframe to improve the camera movement. Once I've got the keyframes roughly set out, I'll drag the timeline slider all the way to the left and hit the play icon. The default time for each video part is 10 seconds and so the more frames added then the faster the camera motion will be and here the time needs to be increased to slow the camera movement down. I'll set this to 45 seconds and give this a try. This looks much better but I might start this part from about here so I may lose the first couple of keyframes later. To create a new video part I click on the plus icon here and as before this will create an initial keyframe. So now I can create a new separate part for the video starting with for example this camera position. Here I can see some fairly major vertical distortion on the poles and the buildings in the distance. So I'll turn on parallelism to counter this effect. Doing so will of course mean that I might now need to adjust the starting view again before creating the keyframes. So I've now changed my mind on a few things, created some more keyframes and made adjustments to the lighting and time of day as well as reversing the direction of the walkthrough in the last section. But at last I'm ready to export the video. If I go back to video and select more, here I can choose the output size and I can choose HD, 4K or a custom resolution. Next I'll go to export and select video 2 and then more from here. This will allow me to set settings such as the file type and from here the frame rate and also the quality and lighting settings. Using these higher settings as I have here will increase render times. Finally I'll select export and I can choose a directory into which to save the file before the export process starts. Twinmotion will estimate the time remaining to create the video and I found from experience that the rendering is generally quicker than that first estimate. The remaining time will update as the exporting progresses. Once completed the resulting MP4 video can, if necessary, be edited in most common video editors and here I've used Final Cut Pro. 
So, that's about the end of what I wanted to cover in this video. Thanks for watching and please feel free to leave any comments below. If you found this video useful then please hit the like button and remember that to keep up with the latest developments in Rhino you can subscribe to this channel. At Simply Rhino we offer training for Rhino and all its key plugins so check out our website for more details. Thanks again for watching and I'll catch up with you in the next video.